So in my last video, I talked about the LV6548 and how it can fit in a server rack. And I now have all the parts to actually build the system. I also spend some time thinking about how I want to configure this system. A lot of people want to have the connections on the back of the server rack by rotating this LV6548 um, around and then running battery cables to the back side. Um, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to connect everything on this side and then I'm going to rotate the whole thing around so that this is all facing the wall. The only thing we need to access is this display interface, but we can run a cable for that. After the system is set up, I don't want to be checking on these batteries or checking anything. I just want to run it. Also yesterday, I found a way to mount it securely and this thing is not moving. Um, a lot of people are suggesting server rack ears um, and I have a lot of those, but those would not work because they would be covering up these ventilation holes. So I actually have a better way instead. So to secure the bottom half of the unit, I use self-tapping screws right here and right here. And to to secure the top of the unit, I'm going to use double-sided tape. And this stuff is very strong. I actually used to use it to mount solar panels. I do not recommend that anymore, but yeah, this stuff is crazy strong. There we go. And it is secure. Wow, that stuff is magic. Now we need to connect the batteries to the unit, but we need to do a diagonal configuration so we can avoid current sharing problems. So this positive will connect right here, and then this negative We'll connect right here. And for this unit, we're using two watt gauge cable. Now these batteries have DC rated circuit breakers that can handle the interrupt current required for having three packs in parallel. So I'm gonna actually connect these directly to the unit itself without a T-class fuse. If these did not have a DC rated circuit breaker, which some cheap server rack batteries have, and you have a lot of batteries in parallel, like a much larger server rack, you're gonna have to use a T-class fuse no matter what. For this configuration with only three batteries, this should do fine. Now you need to ensure that you have the proper size lug for the battery and these require a 5 16 inch hole. Also keep in mind there's an internal fuse to protect this device. So the circuit breakers on the battery are for protecting this conductor and then this fuse protects the device. What? Oh, this goes over here. So we need to cut this circle out because this won't fit unless we do. I hate these things so much. Make sure they're nice and tight. Now these batteries have a pre-charge resistor circuit that you can enable by turning the unit off and then turning it back on again. It takes too much time, especially with three batteries, so I'm just going to do it manually with a $2 resistor. And with all large inverters, you want to attach the cables to the unit first and then attach it to the battery second. Because this cable's dangling around and this one's more secure, I'm going to attach this one first and then we'll use the pre-charge resistor over here. Next, ensure that the batteries are turned on and then attach the resistor like this and charge up those capacitors. After you wait for a few seconds, then you can connect it. And we had no spark, how nice. And then check all of your connections. Battery connections are very important and they cannot be loose. Now this cable is sticking out a little bit, so I'm gonna secure it to this handle. And always feel your connections to ensure that they're nice and tight. It is so important to do this, and I do this every couple weeks on all of my systems, actually. Now let's move on to the AC connections. Now on this unit, we have the AC input right here that goes through this hole, and the AC output over here that goes through this hole. Now depending on which cable and configuration you wish to use will determine how you're gonna connect to this unit. Now some people will only use 120 volts, and you can use these terminals to connect to a small panel or a load center. Or if you're using two or three inverters for a split phase or three phase output, you're gonna connect this AC output to that load center. And there are diagrams on how to wire this up in the manual, or you can watch my older videos. Now for this project, I'm not gonna run a load center. I only need to run a 120 volt heat pump. So I'm gonna attach it right here and then attach a cord right here for the AC charger. Now your loads and how you configure the charger will determine the conductor size. And for me to use the AC charger, with 1500 watts, I can use a 14 gauge male prong extension cord and a 12 gauge extension cord for the AC output. So just push it in there. 
Now in the future, I'll probably add a larger load center, but I don't have any loads to really run with it because this is only 120 volts. Now if I configure this for 240 volt, I will add a load center. And I have lots of videos covering that, so I don't wanna say the same thing a million times. So I'll have those linked below if you wanna learn more. So now all the connections are made and we need to connect this display unit to these cables right here. I don't think it gets easier than this, guys. I just built a massive system in less than an hour. Now the last step is rotating this towards the wall. Um, whatever wall you mount it towards, you should put hardy board or cement board. Um, just in case something happens or one of these wires gets really hot, you want a non-combustible material on this side. And then we just hook up the solar and it should fire right up. But it's pretty heavy. <laughs> How clean is that? <laughs> That's beautiful. So simple, anybody can do it. And this side looks really good. There's not a whole lot going on. So let's connect the solar panels. Now, before you connect the solar panels, you need to ensure that it's at a safe operating voltage for this unit. And I just did, so let's plug it in. Ta-da. And it just clicked on. Now let's turn on the display and turn on the inverter. And here's a large ethernet cord, so we're gonna plug it in over here. And then plugging it in over here, <laughs> this is so cool. Oh, I hate that beep. All right, let's turn on the inverter and it's on. How cool is that? 120 volts. So the first thing I do is set the absorption for the solar charge controller. But depending on how you plan to use this unit will determine the settings. So please check out my website or my other videos where I teach you how to do split phase output. But yeah, this system is up and running. And you can also mount this wherever you please. You can use double-sided tape and put it right here, or you can mount this on the wall next to the unit. Or you can run the cable pretty far and put it in another room. And I don't think it gets easier than this, guys. This is so easy to build and super cheap. The cost per watt hour of these batteries is just crazy. And it's nearly a plug and play system. Actually, let's do a quick price comparison. So for three batteries, they're $1,800 each, which gives us $5,400. The server rack is another $150, or it's free if you buy multiple batteries. And the LV6548 is $1,600. And then add a $10 ethernet cable and the battery cables, that's another cost. Let's add $100 to be on the safe side. And then let's add $50 for the AC cables. And most people are gonna use a load center for the AC output. So let's add another $50 for that as well. And the solar panel and the MC4 extension cables. So MC4 extension cables, let's throw in another $60. And that comes out to $7,420. The only other piece you need is the solar panels. And this unit can handle 8,000 watts of solar. So some people will only use 1,000 watts, some people will use 5,000, and some people will max it out all the way. And that can change the cost significantly. I'm gonna check the price of the solar panels on my website just to see what they're at right now. So about 50 cents per watt. So to max the solar input, it would cost $4,000. And the mounting hardware and labor to build the solar array. Now personally, I think I would go with a double stack. You have 30 kilowatt hours, you have a 240 volt output, so you can actually use it with a transfer switch to back up your whole house. And the system would be completely off grid. Unlike a Tesla Powerwall, you do not need a Wi-Fi connection or any communication connection. This is a standalone unit that you can run for as long as you want. And the batteries are lithium iron phosphate. The Tesla Powerwall and most of the other ones are using NMC because they're cheaper to make because they're making a lot of them. So they have a massive manufacturing scale for those. But in the future, Tesla says that they're supposed to use lithium iron phosphate for their household storage units, but I'm not sure when that will occur. That will make them very heavy. So I'm not sure if they're going to actually have it as a Powerwall. They might actually have a power ground unit or something, I don't know. And everything is user serviceable. If something breaks, even on this all-in-one unit, you can swap out the individual boards. People think that because it's an all-in-one unit, you can't work on it, and that's completely false. You can absolutely work on every part of this board. And the batteries, whatever you need to fix, you can do it. But this configuration should last 20 to 30 years, especially considering the C rate when used for solar. Um, calendar aging will kill these before anything else does, in my opinion. And I have other videos on that if you want to learn more. 
what would you guys do differently? Or would you use a different server rack? I like this server rack because there's lots of airflow to this all-in-one unit. If there were sheets of metal on all sides, it would not have a lot of airflow. And they should have new sizes for the server rack that are even taller. So you could have some serious capacity in here. One thing that I would personally add is a Victron shunt on the negative main conductor for the all-in-one system. So I could use Bluetooth and check on the state of charge. And that's about it. I want to keep it simple and very reliable. So I hope you guys liked the video and I will see you in the next one. Bye.